talked about events in the history of Belle Plain is the story of Jumbo Well. It is probably the iconic event for the town. Let's take a look back and see how a simple well became known, for a while at least, as the eighth wonder of the world. As Belle Plaine started to take shape as a town in the 1860s through the 1880s, the need for freshwater wells was growing. Wells had been drilled on the north side of town, and the residents commented that the water had a different taste to it, and was even thought to be medicinal. As more wells were needed, local businesses were privately contracting with various drilling companies for their needs. One of these companies was William Ware and Sons out of Monticello, Iowa. One of the earliest photographs of Belle Plain is Mr. Ware at the Tremont House, showing a successful well springing forth in the power of the artesian vein that flowed underneath Belle Plain. To the north of town, the water would rise to 20 feet of the surface. Near the business district, lower in grade, the water had sufficient pressure to gush 40 feet in the air through a one-inch pipe. The city contracted for Ware and Sons to dig a well in the southern part of the town to provide water and fire protection for a new school that had just been constructed some seven years earlier. Mr. Ware began his work. The contract called for a three-inch well, but Ware only had two-inch drilling equipment. His plan was to allow the water pressure to ream out the hole, and then he was to drive in his casing. He was good at finding water, and well, the rest is history. The well we now know as Jumbo began flowing at 1.30 on Thursday, August 26, 1886, at a depth of 195 feet. The well soon got out of control. The water was flowing at a tremendous rate, and Ware did not have the sufficient tooling to stop it. His system had backfired on him. To understand what exactly had happened, we need to look at what an artesian vein of water is. Under Iowa, there are several large buried valley aquifers that were left over after the last ice age. These are captured seas of water. Here is a short video to explain what happens when an artesian well comes in. Water volume is always distributed equally in a pool or within a system of pipes. The water table is the level it would reach if evenly distributed. Artesian wells are built where a porous layer of rock full of water lies between impermeable rock layers. If the porous layer is inclined, the water is prevented from reaching the water table by the surrounding impermeable layers. The higher the water table, the greater the water pressure. When a hole is bored to tap into the water source, the water rises up the well to reach the water table. Exactly as this shows, Mr. Ware dug this fateful well at the low end of the pressure grade. He had in essence popped the balloon of water and it was flowing. Estimates are that the flow was at 3,000 gallons per minute. The water began to flood the southern part of town. Mr. Ware tried several times to stem the flow of water but it had gotten completely out of control. He left that Friday night, August 27th. He did not return. Panic hit the town. Tons of sand was being forced out with the water, clogging the ditch that at points was 12 feet wide and a foot deep, directing the water flow all the way to the Iowa River. Telegrams were sent to find a pile driver. The well was pouring out rocks and petrified wood. Young men, seeking to find, make some money, bottled the water and sold it to onlookers that were coming from all around to see the well. On Saturday, August 28th, Eugene Palmer with Palmer Brothers suggested the use of a boiler flue. The pile driver was finally located and with effort the flues were pushed into the gushing well. It was thought that the water was almost under control. The following is from the Centennial Book. A cheer went up from the crowd. The pile driver hit the section a few more times for good measure to make doubly sure it would not wash out. A gasp of incredulity and horror rose from the watchers. The whole thing went into the cavity, flues, stack, and all. The Palmer brothers made another attempt to get the flow stopped, but this effort too failed. A watertight crib with an opening to the east and a cover was erected. 
the water kept flowing. Nothing more was done until October 12th. The council put out bids to control the well, and on October 21st, 1886, a contract was agreed by Mr. Luther King of Marshalltown. The contract was for $2,000 and the work to be done in 90 days. Mr. King, seeing a chance to make some extra money from the throngs of people that were coming to see Jumble Well, built a wooden wall around the well and began charging people to see the event. He put on a diving suit and went down as deep as 85 feet but found nothing. The city council ordered him to stop the sideshow and finish the task at stopping the flow of water. King tried various methods of stopping the flow. In March and April of 1887, he put in 162 feet of 18-inch piping with no result. He began to put in filling and he also cemented the cavity. Pumps kept the area free of water while the casing was covered with cement. Another leak appeared and a 2-inch pipe was put in the leak and cement packed around it. Another valve was ordered. A manhole box was put around the valve when it was installed and cement around the box. King was hopeful that this had finally stemmed the flow of water. The derrick finally was removed and the site cleaned up. King notified the council he was ready to close the contract. The council inspected the site. They shut off the valve in the large pipe and plugged the small pipe. The water began to flow again around the cement. Jumbo was not going to go away without a fight. The council denied Mr. King any payment. On June 3rd, the city turned to the Palmer brothers again to finish the job. In September, the Palmers proceeded to remove some of King's handiwork and put down 90 feet of 8-inch pipe with an invention the Palmers made for shutting off the water between the two pipes. By October 6, 1887, the cavity was almost completely filled and Jumbo was considered under control. According to Mr. C. A. Huston in his Jumbo Well report, he stated that the well was drilled to 193 feet and it consumed 77 feet of 16 inch pipe, 60 feet of 5 inch pipe, a large cone that was attached to 162 feet of 18 inch pipe, besides the 40 carloads of stone, 130 barrels of cement, and the amount of sand and clay that no one could even begin to count. So after 14 months of running loose, Jumbo Well was finally harnessed. On December 3, 1954, our large granite boulder was moved to the northeast corner of 8th Avenue and 8th Street intersection to mark the site of the famous Jumbo Well. The water that now flows from the well empties into Minnow Creek to the east. The ladies of the Artesia chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution purchased a pl bronze plaque to be placed on the stone to commemorate the historic site. On May 21, 1955, the bronze plaque was dedicated in a ceremony held upon the site. But the story of Jumbo is not over. There are two other events that have shown that this Artesian vein still has power. In 1957, on the Elmer Janes farm, a well was drilled and water worked outside of the casing. This flow slowed or ceased other wells in the area. The well was finally recased. The Iowa DNR on their Iowa Geological and Water Survey page reported that in 1984, the Geological Survey's research driller, Darwin Evans, found the aquifer was still a force to be reckoned with when he drilled a test hole into it in 1984. While his efforts to control and plug the hole took a few hours as opposed to 13 months, the situation prompted him to comment, we were about five minutes away from making Good Morning America. <laughs>